Welcome everyone, good afternoon, and we're delighted you're joining us here at CSIS. I'm Lily Makui, I'm a fellow and deputy director in the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. Today we are delighted to be joined by Leda Hong Fisher to discuss her wonderful book, Leftover Women, The Resurgence of Gender Inequality in China. It's the 10th anniversary edition published by Bloomsbury, updated thoroughly and grows out of extensive research into the condition of women today in mainland China. It looks at the intersection of gender inequality in China and the massive accumulation in real estate wealth over the past decade. Joining us to discuss the book are Chu Ran Zheng. Excuse me, I didn't in introduce Leda first. <laughs> please, please excuse me. Leda, a research associate at Columbia University's Weatherhead East Asian Institute, an award-winning former journalist and has extensive experience in China and the United States. And if I'm not mistaken, she was the first American to be a doctoral candidate in sociology at Tsinghua University, which is pretty cool. Now I'll turn to Chu Ranjung, <laughs> who is a Chinese feminist activist and organizer. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. And Emily Whalen, who is a senior associate in the Smart Women, Smart Power Initiative here at CSIS. Thank you, Emily. I'd like to remind our audience that we are going to be taking audience questions. I don't mean to be rude, but I will be looking at my phone because that's where your questions will be coming through. So I will be doing that throughout our discussion this afternoon. I'd like to begin, Leda, by talking about the origins of leftover women, about the concept in Chinese discourse and your own interest in it. What prompted you to start researching this concept? Sure. Well, I was um, doing my PhD in sociology at Tsinghua University at the time. And actually, there's a bit of a prelude to that because I was a longtime journalist in China. But the reason I was doing the PhD is because I didn't get my journalist visa mm -hmm. from the Chinese government and we had relocated to China. So I was looking for a way to continue doing work. So I was in my first year um, as a sociology PhD student and I was just doing um, uh, an, an exercise for my sociology of work class and we had to do a, an ethnography of workers, and I chose to study real estate agents. So I was observing real estate agents with this incredibly hot real estate boom in Beijing, which is where I was living as well. Um, and as I started interviewing people, um, one of the female real estate agents who was actually helping me or had helped me look for an apartment told me that she was engaged to be married um, and that she had saved up a lot of money, but she handed over her life savings to her fiance to finance the purchase of a marital home, but that the home didn't have her name on the deed. And so I, I thought, that doesn't sound like a very smart thing to do, but you're really intelligent. You know, why, why are you doing that? And don't you feel that that might be unequal? Is this really a good idea? Um, so that was the first time I, I, I found out about the gendered nature of home buying. Um, and then I did more interviews and I started asking more particular questions about why these women who were very young in their 20s for the most part, why they felt like they had to accept what seemed to me to be a blatantly unequal relationship. Why were they in such a rush to marry in the first place? And then several of the women said, well, you know, I'm, I'm almost a sheng nu. I'm almost a quote unquote leftover woman. You know, I really need to hurry up. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to find a husband. So that was my first exposure to the term. Um, and then I kept asking more and more questions about it. And, um, and then doing research into the term, I kind of I came upon all of these articles from Xinhua News, the official state media agency. And, um, and then I basically came up with the argument that this is not just a free-floating term, that this is actually a deliberate propaganda campaign coming from the Chinese government. And I made the argument, because there wasn't total proof, I have to say, but based on everything that I had dug up about what was going on in China, um, I made the argument that um, this kind of dovetails with China's population planning goals mm -hmm. because the state council had at the beginning of 2007 said that China faces an urgent problem of low population quality. 
um, or, or su su zhenko, su and China urgently needed to upgrade population quality. Um, otherwise, China is not going to be able to compete in this fierce marketplace of the future. We need to have more knowledge-based, skilled workers in the future. Um, and so uh, the State Council said all of these different government agencies are going to make it their goal to upgrade population quality. And one of, one of the agencies named was the All China Women's Federation. Um, and then, then I, I just noticed that this cannot possibly be an accident because just everywhere you, you look, all over the internet, there are all these sta state media articles that are absolutely egregiously misogynistic, um, saying that if you're an uh, urban woman who's professional and you're 27, you know, you have to hurry up and marry. Otherwise, no man's ever going to want you. You're going to be too old and um, all these horrible things will happen to you. You know, it'll be too late for you to have a baby. Your baby's going to have a lot of birth defects. Um, so it was really a natural process of discovery through my interviews. And then I wound up doing my uh, PhD thesis on it. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much for that comprehensive introduction. I personally was really shocked at some of the quotes that you included from columns that had been cross-posted with the All-China Women's Federation and some of the dialogue that we're seeing from the party state on this issue already back 15 years ago. The 10th anniversary edition, can you tell us why you thought now was the time to update? I think a lot of us around this table think that you were quite prescient in, in documenting a, a, trends, a trend that has only continued and really been very evident over the past 10 years in terms of gender inequality in China. What were some of the main observations looking back uh, now when you were updating this book? Yes. Well, um, the timing of it was actually Bloomsbury asked me if I wanted to work on a revised edition. And, and I hadn't thought about this book in years. And so I, I thought, oh, sure, I'll write a preface. That's mm -hmm. fine. Um, you know, I was focused on other things. But then when I reread the original edition, I thought, wow, you know, this is really, really fascinating. And especially given some major changes that have taken place over the last few years. One of the most major, I would say, demographically, is um, plummeting marriage and birth rates. And it, it, I mean, it's quite uncanny that in 2013, just when I was finishing the interviews for the first edition of my book and my PhD, marriage rates peaked mm -hmm. in China. And they have been falling for nine consecutive years. And then the birth rate has also been falling, um, basically right after the one-child policy was ended, the birth rate has continued to mm -hmm. fall. I mean, it, these are such seismic changes, so huge that last year um, China's population shrank for the first time in over mm -hmm. 60 years. And the, and the last time it shrank was during uh, the catastrophic famine of the Great Leap Forward. Mm -hmm. So these are huge changes for the country. Um, but one thing that I, I thought about and recalled was, you know, even when I was doing my interviews back in 2011 and 2012 to 2013, I encountered and, and in fact put in the original edition some very radical young women in their mm. 20s who told me, I'm never going to get married. I'm never going to have a child. And there's no way you could get me to do that. Marriage is a living hell. <laughs> And, I, and when I was doing those interviews, I was really taken aback by, I mean, the radicalism of that. Um, and so even f for the original edition, I, I said, well, you know, the data at the time showed that almost all women in China got married back then. Um, and uh, at the same time, women even then were more educated than ever before in Chinese history. Um, and they continue to be very well educated. Um, and so uh, this is something, you know, that should be really celebrated by the government. But, but what the government has done is treat the unprecedented levels of education among young Chinese women as, as a threat or a grave crisis instead of something to be celebrated. Mm -hmm. so, um, so for the original edition, I, I, I included these interviews with 
young women who said they didn't want to marry. And I said, but, you know, but, but this is really an exception because look at all the other, the data uh, and all, a lot of the interviews that I did showing that women were making enormous sacrifices and they really felt like they had to marry. But then I, I, I said originally that, you know, if women's rights don't improve, in China, then I, I'm sure there are going to be more women mm -hmm. taking this path that is quite radical is for China in particular, um, saying no to marriage because of the intense marriage pressure and child rearing pressure. And so mm -hmm. that was just one of the factors that made me think, okay, I, I should actually go through the book and fully revise it and fully update it because there's a lot more data today and a lot of new data about the real estate boom mm -hmm. as well and, and women's rights and property rights and um, another thing that it, that is very important um, is that the government has made it much more difficult to get a divorce and so I have this whole chapter about mm -hmm. domestic violence and it's even more difficult today for women to escape an abusive marriage than it was, you know, when this book came out over a decade ago. But there are so many changes like that. In fact, one of the biggest changes as well was um, this real feminist awakening. Mm -hmm. And um, and of course, Zheng Chuan yeah. is, you know, a, a, one of the very prominent feminists in China who who can talk to us yeah. about that as well. Right. Fantastic. Uh, I think that's a perfect intersection for me to turn it over and bring Chu Ran and Emily into the conversation. Chu Ran, I'd love to get your thoughts as a Chinese feminist on this concept, on the book, um, and the state of gender inequality in China today. Yeah. First of all, my English is not that good, so you have to know that I am a billion times smarter when I'm speaking <laughs> Cantonese, all right? I right? you, but then you're really, really smart then. <laughs> yes. Wow. <laughs> yes, I, I think uh, let us prediction about the, the marriage rate and the birth rate will set down for, for a long period. I, I think that's very amazing prediction because it ha it's happening now. and. Um, you know, women in China, they suffer from a lot of gender discrimination, gender violence, no matter in their house, in, in their family, in the school, in um, employment. Um, th there's a lot of discrimination there and we are, we are struggle to get a higher education level or a higher employment level um, when we are competing with men and not to mention LGBT people in China and they are suffering more, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, the, and the hardest part is if you f want to fight back, it, it will be consequence. Uh, like if you are fighting for uh, domestic violence and like let us say before, it's hard to get a divorce. And if mm -hmm. you are, if it, it, it's not just the time, not just the money for eternity or something. And it, it's, it's like, it's impossible to get a divorce when when you apply for a divorce it will have been a month of of a cool down period mm -hmm. yeah and 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 then a lot of suit in uh, marriage court uh, will be denied um, mm -hmm. although there is a fact that uh, domestic violence is involved so it's it's so hard so you can see now in a lot of um, social media in mainland china young people, young women are talking about not to get married, not to have children. And if, if some uh, new mother, they will share their experience about how they give birth to a baby, how painful is it, and how their husbands are not interested in doing any housework and, and share the burden with them and how they get, get fired by their employ, employers because they are pregnant or they are having a baby. And a lot of people will say that um, if that's the case, I will never get married. I will never give, uh, I, I will never, never give birth to a children um, because I don't want them to suffer everything I am suffering now. And not to mention the activists in China, the feminist activists in China, we always suffer from um, 
uh, monitoring and uh, harassment or maybe like me I was in jail because of anti-sexual harassment movement and so it's hard to fight back and that's the I think that's the most difficulty uh, of gender equality things in China. Mm -hmm. The chapters on domestic abuse were really harrowing for me. Um, and just to describe that condition is just really shocking. And the fact that there's this, in a way, dichotomy between the state wanting young women to get married and making it ma marriage so unappealing that domestic abuse is not even considered in the courts. It's not divorce is difficult to get if needed. Um, and even I think there was an anecdote about taking time off for a honeymoon was looked down upon by employers. So the conditions for getting married are actually getting worse even though the top-down rhetoric and the directives are en enhanced. Thank you, Chiran. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely uh, discuss these topics further, but I want to hand it over to Emily. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, to preface my comments, I come at Leda's work from a little bit of a different perspective. First, um, from the work that we're doing at the Smart Women Smart Pro Power Program here at CSIS, CSIS excuse me, um, where we're looking at one of the projects we're undertaking is analyzing a comparative uh, study of different authoritarian regimes and the ways in which they use gender, which is to say prescribed masculinities and prescribed femininities to consolidate social and political support. I also come at her work as a historian, my trainings as a historian. I study in part the de evolution of the nation state and of the international system. So I'm, what I'm interested in, in um, well, I'm interested in everything, <laughs> but I'm, what I'm looking at, I think, in Leda's work and, and what I notice and what jumps out to me are these broader trends. The ways in which um, you can see this is sort of a, following a pattern for authoritarian regimes over the course of the 20th century, which is to fall back on very restrictive gender roles as a way to sort of cloak, um, cloak political agendas in the language of culture and in the language of nature and morality. It's a way to kind of get it out of the political sphere and into a different sphere that is harder to argue against and that we don't have the same kind of language to push back on. What's interesting to me is I think what, and I think Leda's work reveals this, is um, a couple of things. One, authoritarian regimes don't exist in the absence of, po of popular support. They, they do need popular legitimacy. And one of the ways in which they can garner this popular legitimacy is, again, calling back to restrictive gender norms. The other thing that I notice is how malleable the concept of culture is. So by emphasizing or amplifying certain aspects of traditional culture, the Chinese Communist Party is actually defining what Chinese culture is in this particular moment. Culture is always changing. It's not ontological. It doesn't exist outside of the outside of the course of history. And so what I think we've seen over the past 10 years are really the effects of um, that cultural engineering as well. The pressure that these women are experiencing from their families mm -hmm. and sort of the, the accepted discrimination that women receive from their own families. Those are things that are not necessarily inherent in Chinese culture, but have been engineered to be that way by the Chinese Communist Party. So I think that that's important as well. What I'm interested to hear um, Leda and Churan talk about a little bit more, if you're willing to, um, is I'm wondering if, you know, where are the men in this? Are there, have men in China begun to um, be more open to the ways in which this kind of cultural, this kind of gender prescription is harmful to them as well? Or, you know, um, are, do we see more Chinese men identifying as feminists? Um, yeah, I'd just love to hear both of your thoughts more on that. Yeah, so I really agree with everything that you were saying. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things is that uh, so many people in China say, oh, this is just Chinese culture. Um, but yeah, I completely agree. I know it's not just Chinese culture. Yes, there is, you know, a heavily patriarchal tradition in Confucianism. Um, and I, I like comparing China to um, Japan and South Korea, for example, but that's a whole other topic of female <laughs> labor force participation. Um, but but the culture, it, mm -hmm. it's perceived to be culture, but so much of it really is dictated mm -hmm. through government policy and through propaganda, molding people's thoughts to you know, make um, people believe that oh, this is just naturally yes. occurring. Yeah. So actually, um, I incorporate half of my 
interview subjects were men, mm -hmm. pretty much. I want it, because I didn't start out saying, well, I just want to study women. Not at all. And one thing that really struck me when I was doing my original interviews was, oh, there were some really great men out there, these young men who actually are very egalitarian or really want you know, to treat their, their girlfriend or wife properly. Um, they, uh, or actually even want to share the property wealth with her, which is a whole other area of, of wealth in the form of property ownership. Um, but it, it, this is, it, it, see, time and time again, the state interferes in individuals and family decisions to make it exceedingly difficult to achieve gender equality. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I don't blame just Chinese men in general. Yeah. Not at yeah. all. Yeah. And in fact, if anything, I, I, I came away after doing these interviews with especially young, educated Chinese men, so many of them, I thought, were more enlightened about gender mm -hmm. than American men, in mm -hmm. fact. Mm -hmm. um, but, it, but the role of the state is so... Um, so heavy and it's just omnipresent mm -hmm. and then there's so many ways in which also in which just the regulations regarding purchasing residential real estate as well mm -hmm. uh, you know they kind of pose a huge obstacle to primarily single women who want to buy homes um, there are just so many different ways in which state obstacles regulations combine with propaganda the propaganda also, you know, exerts a lot of pressure on the parents to then push their daughters into getting married and having a baby. And right. uh, uh, so it's just this complex um, multiplicity of ways in which um, the state pushes a kind of version of masculinity where, mm -hmm. and this is not natural. I mean, you could argue that, yes, it was natural in previous centuries, sure. but it really, I didn't really feel that this was natural based on the interviews that I was doing with these young mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. That's great. Truman, would love your thoughts on the role of men here. Yeah, the cultural thing just hit me a lot, uh, like yesterday, because I'm attending this event. So the police call my husband, which uh, who was still who is still in China, mm -hmm. and said, "Oh, you ha you have to be careful. You mm -hmm. will be used by someone." And I was like, "Who's who's this someone?" And then I I I, I keep thinking, what are they asking me to do? Is it for me not to attend this event or just? speak cautiously in this event. So I think there's a gap between the <laughs> powerful men like mm. the police mm. and new generation activists like me. Uh, like if we are going to negotiate mm. in this process about what we can do or what we are all willing to do, can, can you just please not do the implication thing. I, I can't take implication. I think new generation people, we can't take implication. <laughs> it's like you can tell me, you can tell me what you want and, and you can, you can, you can and, and then we can react and we can negotiate to, to, to think um, what is going on here. Mm -hmm. Like the whole culture here, like the, 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 the state, they want the female not to do something, to do something, but they, it's, there's no, there's always not a clarification carif there. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of hard to cooperate with the government mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. make the society better. Mm -hmm. So I think this is the gap between the state and young generation mm -hmm. women here. Mm -hmm. And for the, uh, for the discussion about uh, men participation in this activism, Clearly, there's there are a lot of uh, fabulous men allies working with us, and a lot of them are really good friend with me, and we try a lot of things to do in the activism. But the the real problem is who is the leader of of this movement? It always should be woman, right? And and um, as we can see during Me Too movement, a lot of activists, male activists, were Accused by uh, accused by women that they conduct sexual harassment on a lot of younger women, and it doesn't change a lot. And and no matter how 
nice that man we think it always be something behind this man so it's just so frustrated mm. and uh, I think the, the the better point of view to look at this question is uh, how how women in the activism can take the leadership of the movement and le uh, really lead the lead, lead this activism toward a better place um, a better place for women for all genders but um, not just look into how many men participate in this in, in this in this movement mm -hmm. and I think men if they are really committed to feminism and they will they, they will try their best to help uh, female leadership but not just take over and tell mm -hmm. women what they can do yeah. could I just yeah. jump in and make another point there which is to emphasize that um, Zheng Turan was was one of uh, China's feminist five so she was jailed um, it, it, just on the eve of International Women's Day um, because of this sexual harassment, that, wanting to celebrate by handing out stickers mm -hmm. about sexual harassment. And to this day, I mean, I, uh, since you brought it up, she was contacted um, by somebody, you know, in the Chinese government saying, don't attend this interview. You know, and she's here in America, and so I'm very grateful to you for yes, coming yes, and doing yes, this. Yes. It's, it's, yeah, it's really brave. amazing. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it just shows you the kind of intense surveillance yeah. and persecution that feminist activists in China, and, and in fact, you know, any kind of activist. Mm -hmm. but, but feminism has become a very powerful, resilient movement that the Chinese government is paying very close attention to. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think that's a good um, a good point to talk about your last chapter, which is fighting back, and you explore various forms of protest against gender discrimination in China, and you talk briefly about the relatively high rates of young women who are participating did participate in the white paper protests against the COVID lockdowns, zero COVID policies. Can we talk a little bit more? I'd love to hear later your thoughts and and Chiran, about these this various the various forms of protest here against these uh, gender and marriage norms and uh, the state of, of treatment of women in general in China? Um, why don't I start, but I think you have a lot more interesting mm -hmm. things to say about this actually because I wasn't in yeah. China at the time, um, but the so-called white paper protests um, were really spontaneous. It was just in all these different cities in China primarily young people, took to the streets mm -hmm. um, to call for an end to the zero COVID lockdown. And it was really striking to me um, and also other people reporting on it, how many young women were on the front lines of those protests. And that really tells you something. And to me, it's another indication of how, because women's rights have been so severely eroded just over the last decade. Mm. I mean, things were already really bad. Because, I mean, the subtitle, original subtitle of my book was The Resurgence of Gender Inequality. Uh, and it's even worse now. The inequality has worsened. Um, but what is really different is that rather than kind of quietly suffering and keeping it to themselves and feeling like, there's nothing much they can do about it. There are so many more, I would say millions of young women, especially those who've gone to college, who feel like, you know, I have to do something about it. I have to do something to help myself. And they also have less to lose. Mm -hmm. So also when you're looking at those who take very risky political action, taking part in a street protest, you know, as the white paper movement mm -hmm. was, um, that's extremely dangerous and risky, um, but it's the women who have less to lose mm -hmm. and more to be unhappy about. As bad as things are um, for young men in, in general, it just, you know, if you're, mar if you're a, a woman or part of the marginalized community, LGBTQ plus community, um, you, you've, you have lost even more and, and so, uh, that's kind of my, mm -hmm, my take mm -hmm, on it, mm -hmm. that there's right. more of a sense of desperation. Yeah. And that's also related to the Me Too movement, too. Mm -hmm. it's, 
that's how I feel is that, you know, you see these, and it's mostly women who come out in the Me Too movement who feel like, I know this is going to be bad for me by speaking out, but I can't, I can't help it. I have to do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's just this explosion of incredible discontent and desperation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, I can see from this topic, it's like the 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 Chinese feminist movement during this decade. the The most important achievement is not just uh, pushing the the policy into a more gender equality place, or just change the law, or 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 achieve some award or something like that. There's no award. <laughs> yeah, but the the most important change is changing people's mind. I I think it. I, I think this is the the most important achievement that you are telling people and people are learning from this movement that we have the right we have a right to be anger, we have the right to speak out and we have this right to fight fight back no matter what approach they are using. And this is uh, this is all we are talking about during this decade, like empowering ourselves and see what is the most inequality around you and what you are going to change. You have the right and you have the power to change. So I think this kind of mindset will uh, will affect a lot of young women, especially in the city, mm -hmm. some of them in the rural area. And most of them are in university. Mm -hmm. They are they are they are taking this as a new kind of value that I can I can fight I can fight back. And mm -hmm. there's there's a price, and but I will evaluate the price and see if I can handle it. Mm -hmm. If I can handle it, I can do something. I can actually do something and participate to change a little bit. Mm -hmm. This is the most. Lovely achievement I have ever <laughs> failed. <laughs> that's wonderful. I would, uh, could I jump yeah, in really absolutely. quick? I just wanted to add, you know, I think something that's striking to me um, in this conversation and in, in um, thinking about these topics is just how threatening specifically feminist activism is mm -hmm. for these kinds of authoritarian regimes that seek so strenuously to disenfranchise women. Um, they're seeking very, very um, consistently to take women out of public life and to take women out of political life. So what that strategy does is it creates this hierarchy within society that may benefit the authoritarian regime for a time. But what it means is that when the reaction comes from these women and these people who have been excluded from, um, from public life, like LGBTQI folks, um, it's all the more threatening because it's threatening um, the existential order that mm -hmm. the regime has placed itself on top of. Mm -hmm. So I think that what's particularly interesting uh, for me about, about the Chinese feminism in this, um, in this moment is just how just how um, different it is from the public face that the, that Beijing is putting out to the world. Just a few months ago, you had Xi Jinping talking about how Chinese women need to be having more babies, and um, and it's I think that specifically feminist activism is real is a real threat mm -hmm. um, to these kinds of of powers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're already getting a lot of audience questions, so I want to turn it over. But I want to mention one more topic first to get to it. Um, Leda, I, I thought it was so interesting how you. Um, you argue that population control and development measures aren't just um, numerically focused, but also have an ethnic component to them. Um, and you discuss the singling out of weaker women for forced sterilization. And I want to read this for our audience, if you don't mind, a passage. While some have predicted that the Chinese government will abandon birth restrictions altogether, I believe it's unlikely at the time of writing because of the Communist Party's increasingly heavy-handed authoritarian repression and eugenic population engineering, especially under Xi Jinping. The new birth planning regime may mean a relax relaxation of birth limits for those Han Chinese women who want to have more babies, but it mar marks a dramatic tightening of reproductive controls on Uyghur, Kazakh, and ethnic minority women. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about this differentiated approach to population development? Yeah, so this is another area where there's been a really huge, incredibly disturbing uh, development over the last decade. Is that when I did the original research and was writing the book, I mean, I did actually include this whole section about how, in fact, I argued that the whole leftover women propaganda campaign was designed to so called upgrade population quality. Um, and how do you do that? You focus on the propaganda targets 
college educated Han Chinese women is very obvious that mm -hmm. that's the uh, the particular demographic that the government is targeting with its pro-marriage pro-natalist message so when I, I wrote uh, the book originally it, the one child policy was in force mm -hmm. um, now you know, this was before the mass detention of the weaker mm. people. And um, in updating the new edition, um, you see so much more how the eugenics, which is an integral part of China's population engineering plan, has become extremely disturbing and actually carried out forcibly, mm. particularly in Xinjiang, with um, not just the mass detention of a lot of uh, the weaker people, but the it's been so many people have done these uh, studies about the mass campaigns of forced sterilization of weaker and Kazakh women as well. Um, and uh, you've heard accounts of forced abortions, um, you know, forced insertion of IUDs. And even the United Nations report on um, human rights abuses in Xinjiang points to a sharp drop in the birth rate in Xinjiang starting in 2017. So um, in 2017, the Chinese government had introduced the two-child policy. It had already ended the one-child policy. But then it also said, okay, so that means when you're an urban married couple, you're allowed to have two children. So for a Han Chinese urban married couple, that's a relaxation of a prior limit. But if you're ethnic minority, now the ethnic minorities had, according to the government, been allowed to have one child more than Han Chinese. But then in 2017, the government said, in the name of quote unquote ethnic equality, everybody, every married couple is going to have two children. That was actually a severe curtailment of the reproductive rights mm -hmm. of ethnic minority women and really hitting the Uyghur and Kazakh women particularly hard because they had up until then routinely had three or more children. A lot of, I mean, there's uneven enforcement. A lot of times the local officials turned a blind eye mm -hmm. to um, ethnic minority women having a lot more than three children. But starting in 2017, um, in fact, I have an interview, I have a very harrowing interview with one Uyghur woman who describes her own forced sterilization. Um, and and it's, uh, you know, it's just one of the atrocities that has you know, been carried out mm -hmm. by the Chinese government. And so there is this, it's this, this concept of what constitutes a high quality person clearly you know, in the government's view, it's somebody who is uh, educated, who is Han Chinese. Um, those are the women that they want to be getting married and having more children. But other people of other ethnicities, especially the weaker people, are seen as troublemakers, are seen as quote unquote low quality. Then the government's going to go in and forcibly force down the birth rate. So this is, this is just another illustration of how this is, um, you know, the new, and now it's a new three-child policy. Mm -hmm. That is not a relaxation of reproductive controls. It is going to be increasingly, I believe, heavily pro-natalist if you're uh, majority mm -hmm. Han Chinese, and it, there's still going to be very draconian enforcement of birth limits mm -hmm. if you're especially Uyghur or mm -hmm. Kazakh. Mm -hmm. That's a very sort of disturbing picture that you describe in terms of population engineering. We are getting a lot of interest in the mainland, uh, the Chinese translation of your book uh, from the audience. Um, in terms of when it came out, what that process was like, um, and whether you think that you know the same could happen today. Um, so I'll take that first question, or the last question yeah. first. Okay. No, I absolutely do not believe I can't imagine the new edition of my book being able to come out in the mainland. I mean, things have been, become so incredibly repressive over the last 10 years under Xi Jinping's rule. Um, so what is incredible, I mean, when I think about how I did the research for the original book, there was a mainland Chinese publisher, um, 
And, you know, I'm not even going to name them because it's just, mm -hmm. I don't want them to be, I don't even know if they still exist. But I do know that the book, the book came out in 2017 on the mainland mm -hmm. and it was quite lightly censored. Mm -hmm. So at the time that um, they, the, the publisher just put it out on the market, I was originally supposed to, to see the whole manuscript beforehand and vet the changes, but they just put it out there. And at the time, I was quite upset. I thought, what? I didn't get a chance to see what you took out or what you wanted to take out. Um, and I had this wonderful translator, um, who I won't name here, but you can look him up, <laughs> who actually gave me a, a list of everything that was taken out. Wow. And um, I have to say, I was really surprised at how much they basically left in mm -hmm. there. So, um, so the book was actually very popular mm -hmm. when it came out and there was, you know, I was interviewed by a lot of even state media journalists um, who were really focusing on the element of marrying and buying a home mm -hmm. as well as the term leftover woman and what that meant mm -hmm. because that wasn't perceived to be a very political thing. Um, I think the political elements or perceived troublesome political mm -hmm. elements of the book are much more apparent in the new edition uh, because of what has been happening over the last decade, which I uh, kind mm -hmm. of detail mm -hmm. in throughout the book. Um, but I, I, I kind of look back and think, my God, I mean, it was, yes, of course, things were very restrictive then, but it was so much freer back in 2016. Mm -hmm sadly, than it is today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Turan, would you agree with that observation in terms of this closing of space to even discuss these issues in China? Yeah, but actually I saw your book in WeChat reading. Yeah, mm -hmm. we can still read it, but I, but um, yes, I, I, I don't know which part of them is, is cancelled, is, is deleted. I don't know any of I, I don't know any of that, but I'm sure they, that there will be a lot of deleting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it's more that I don't think a publisher would yeah. translate the whole mm -hmm. book and put it out as a new book. But but I mean it's true. I'm I'm really glad to see actually um, one of my students at Columbia just sent me a photograph of the book. She had seen it at a bookstore in Chengdu. So it's not it hasn't been, you know, right. raised and right burned and all traces disappeared. Sure, disappeared. Sure. <laughs> so that, I'm really glad to see yes. that. Right. Maybe the title of the book is more like a hostile story book, something <laughs> like that, because the leftover, the leftover remain, this, this word is more, it's very popular mm -hmm. and, and it's funny. So maybe they are not censored very much. <laughs> it's true. And the title in mainland China is um, 剩女时代, or the mm -hmm. times Leftover Women Times, yeah. it kind of mm, sounds really carefree, right. yeah. uh, but, but in fact it's a very r beautifully translated mm. book with light censorship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, we, we at CSIS, we look at a lot of Chinese documents and it's, it's interesting to think about the different levels of closure of information space, right? There's the actual access component but there's also this kind of self-censorship component in terms of the intellectual communities in China and authoritarian regimes overall, probably, mm -hmm. um, in, in shaping the types of content that comes out as well. Um, so uh, that's very helpful. I, um, I, we definitely have audience questions, and I apologize for looking at my phone with this, but one of them is about state-sponsored matchmaking services. Um, and one audience member wants to know how widely accepted these are in China and whether they're viewed as, as an intrusion of the state in people's private lives or not, in terms of the perspective of those participating. Yeah. I, yeah. Can I just say that that was a, already a big thing when I was mm -hmm. writing the first um, edition of the book, um, that there were, were these mass matchmaking initiatives um, by local governments, and, and this was something that I, that I described in the first edition, that has taken off so much more mm. in the last decade. And so with some of the new interviews that I did, 
um, one of the examples I gave was to illustrate that that intense marriage pressure is definitely still there. And in some ways, it's even more intense mm -hmm. today. But um, there was this woman who, who said she was not going to marry and she didn't want to marry. Um, but even her employer was organizing mm -hmm. matchmaking and kind of pressuring her to take part in matchmaking. Um, mm -hmm. But these are very, very unpopular. I mean, she described it. The people who took part in mass matchmaking and it, it, originally, it was just beginning to take off when I was writing mm -hmm. the book, and now it's so much more popular. I mean, women are, by and large, really recoiling from that. It tends to be more actually parents who really want to go in there and the parents are very proactive uh, trying to you know arrange dates for blind dates for their not just for their their daughter also for their son but it's the women tend to see this as really something they, they don't want to do mm -hmm. um, what do you think I didn't really understand the question so oh. these matchmaking events so um, Oh, oh, oh. But government sponsored. So the government is organizing them. And uh, is that accepted? Or is it seen as an intrusion in, in someone's private life? Yeah, I, I didn't heard much about this government organized match uh, story. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, there's in, in, uh, in social media in China, we have this whole genre of uh, ridiculous match, uh, match, making. Ma match making story, and I, I really enjoy that. Oh, I want to read that. Really, <laughs> this amazing, a lot of crazy story there. Yeah, and <laughs> people are share their their experience in in match making, yeah. and they they will keep talking about uh, the the guys, the guys. The guys, uh, how the guys talk, how 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 gender how gender discriminate how gender discriminate he can be, uh -huh. and how's the, the the whole family the culture behind his behavior, and they are they are all talking about that, mm -hmm. and they will share. Oh, the most amazing thing is, I uh, a lot of women will post this story and said they will never get married, they will be single, and mm. they are lead, uh, they are leading a alternative life to be in single and but we live well in mm -hmm. uh, in uh, no matter how rich they are or mm -hmm. how poor they are and they are setting an example setting a model for younger generation women to to let people to see that oh if i am not going to be into the marriage i can still live live the, lead in a really good um, life mm -hmm. yeah that's very amazing mm -hmm. because they are they are already sharing this experience to the public right yeah. so interesting uh, it's reminding me of, you know, the um, in sort of thinking about the ways in which regimes can exert power, right, the propaganda has a limit. There's a limit to how much a regime, no matter how powerful they are, can shape people's imaginations or engineer people's desires and or conceptions of what's possible. Mm -hmm. And sort of when you push too far, you risk kind of putting people off of it. It kind of sounds like that's what's going on, where these sort of state engineered um, matchmaking services are really actually putting people off the of marriage. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can I just add another point, though? It's that the pressure from the government, I think, is more directly being applied on the older generation mm -hmm. now. And mm -hmm. because the most effective agent for pressuring, especially a young woman, to get married is her own parents. Mm. And this is how the government, this is a very disturbing but very powerful way in which the state exerts control over individuals is by, well, I mean, even with, in your case, you know, going and going through your family and saying, you know, we're seeing what you're doing and we don't want, you know, we don't, you're telling your, your family members or friends, we don't want her to be doing this. Mm -hmm. And so, th mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's on, on one level, but on another level, it's in terms of marriage pressure, it's um, uh, the parents are getting pressure from around them, from their own employers. Oh, you! Why isn't your daughter mm. married yet? Mm. And then the parent may suffer consequences that's if their daughter 
is not married, then the parents getting all of this and, mm -hmm. oh, you know, I, I don't know this. Why is my boss bothering me? Or why is this local official, um, you know, harassing mm -hmm. me about my daughter? Okay, let me just take it out on my mm -hmm. daughter. You know, you're making us look, telling the daughter, you're making us look bad. You're making us lose face. Mm -hmm. um, or the entire extended family. This is another dynamic that is still very real today. Mm -hmm. And, and I believe it'll get more intense, this pressure from the whole extended family, especially around holidays when, you know, young people go home to their hometown and they're with their extended family. And, and it's the, the people you love who are telling you, mm -hmm. you should do yeah. this. Or, you know, or the, the state, you know, somebody representing the state is saying, you did you know, don't you feel bad for your parents? You're causing them to suffer. Um, mm. So stop doing mm -hmm. this. You know, you need to be, you know, behave better and, mm -hmm. and you need to be a better daughter or something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, it's that weaponization of the family. Mm. And, and, and also you see it in collective punishment where parents get, sometimes in the extreme, get detained. Um, so mm. this is, interesting. yeah, this yeah. is a very disturbing, but very powerful yeah. tool yeah. Yeah. for the government. Yeah. Yeah. Can I add on Please. that? Um, yeah, I think that's really important to, to see how the government um, work with this tool, the family thing, to control their daughters. And it's also really important for us to pay attention to how these younger women, they fight back. And mm -hmm. it's really creative, like sharing those crazy story mm -hmm. and um, some of them are just breaking the close relationship with their parents. Like we are leading a very independent life now, and I can set a, I can set an example for other other young women that we don't need to have this close relationship with our parents, and um, or, or maybe some kind of different approach like. Uh, when when the parents tell them to get married, they say, yes, yes, okay, next year, next year I will get married, and then next year, and then next year, and then next year. And this, those, strat those strategies and tactics are really interesting and so mm -hmm. creative. And so I, mm -hmm. I, I celebrate for our collective wisdom to fight back off this, the whole system. Mm -hmm. Creative tactics in fighting back and also create creative tactics in forcing this issue on the part of the state in terms of weaponization of the family. I mean, you know, it's it's not easy to ignore the state in China, of course, but I would say the immediacy of the of, of parental responses, you know, feelings of responsibility toward your parents and also I think it's almost a universal wanting to please your parents and your family in some way uh, is a really creative way of forcing this issue. Um, I, I definitely want to uh, just zoom out a little bit and think on a comparative level. And I'd love to get your thoughts, Emily, here. Sure. I was struck by the share of the world's population that you're describing. One sixth of the world's women are in China, which is just, this is a massive issue. So um, already in itself, we're, we're dealing with a lot of, of women in the world, but comparatively speaking, a lot of the themes here that you describe, some are unique to China, but some have um, some are mirrored in, in other authoritarian regimes in particular. Mm -hmm. What are some of the, Emily, if you don't mind, what are some of the main themes that you think kind of transcend uh, sure. global experience for women? Yeah, I think, um, you know, in terms of comparative case studies, the one that is m top of mind these days um, for, I think, anybody who does this kind of work is Russia. Mm. Women um, experienced a precipitous decline in status in Russia. Um, just in the immediate um, sort of years before the Russian invasion of Ukraine last year. And um, a lot of folks, particularly Elizabeth Wood, are making the argument that that was sort of a, a canary in the coal mine. Women, the status of women is a uh, perhaps an indicator for the ways in which a particular state is um, may behave mm -hmm. sort of in the global order. I think for me, um, what strikes me as really similar is a focus on birth rate. Mm -hmm. um, particularly in Russia, although it's for different reasons. So in China, I think that the, the perception of a declining birth rate is that it will put China at an economic disadvantage in the global economy, whereas the focus um, in Russia on birth rate has a lot more to do with staffing the security state and staffing the, mm -hmm. the Russian army. 
Um, and you see this in other authoritarian and authoritarian leaning regimes as a, as a focus on birth rate for different reasons, but there's a, a major focus on birth rate. For me, that as a scholar of the state, I, it, I, it makes me think about you know, what we perceive a state to be um, and the necessity of maintaining a growing population to that. And that's a model for statehood that comes out of a very particular historical moment and one that may not be relevant to our current historical moment. Mm -hmm. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. <laughs> but um, I, so that, those are some things that jump out. Um, I think another thing in comparative perspective that um, is highlighted for me is the presence of violence within the system. So the way that we think about states um, comes out of a tradition in the West um, that says the state is going to have a monopoly on violence and that violence is not going to occur in a state if you support a regime that con controls all of the violence for lack of a better phrase. Um, but that's just not true, right? We see it in latest work on, um, on uh, domestic violence. We see it in stories of activists who are imprisoned for their work. There is violence in the system. What gender does and what regressive gender norms do is organize that violence. And they sort of give a tacit and roadmap for who can commit violence against whom. Wow. And, um, and you see that, I think, in, again, most authoritarian regimes and authoritarian leaning regimes. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating and very scary at the it same is. time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, there's one there's one piece of this that we haven't yet discussed, and that's the real estate intersection. I don't think we've you know gone into that as much, but it's a really fascinating aspect of your book. Um, this intersection between uh, pressure on young women to get married and the the massive gender disparities in wealth accumulation over the past decade because a lot of Chinese household wealth is in real estate. Can you talk a little bit more about that intersection so, so we get to it? Because I think that, you know, for all of our readers, our audience, I really recommend you read this, but I think it's an important preview of, of some of the really fascinating content in your book. Yeah, I mean, this is really quite complicated, but, um, one of the things, of, of course, so when I was writing this book, there's a massive um, real estate boom going on. Everybody was just absolutely obsessed with buying a home, which is why I decided to do my, you know, an, an assignment for class on uh, an ethnography of, of real estate agents because I thought, oh, this is just such an interesting mm -hmm. new development. Um, because, of course, China used to be communist and housing was basically free. It was assigned by the state. It was, uh, you didn't have to pay anything for it. So in this process of the privatization of housing that began at the end of the 1990s, um, the, little by little, the government introduced incentives for people who were already dwelling in their uh, state allocated mm -hmm. home to purchase the home, to marketize this, uh, this property. And basically, um, there were people who got in early and they benefited and became enormously wealthy. Um, those tended to be men. And there were people who were really left out. And, and, and in, in the course of my research, there wasn't a hell of a lot of data about the gender gap in property ownership. Um, but because it just was so glaringly obvious in the interviews that I did, um, I, I think I already mentioned that a lot of the young women who were getting married would just hand over their yeah. life savings um, to a boyfriend who would then have the marital home in his name only. And why is that? There are all these different mechanisms. Basically, one of the reasons is because real estate had become so incredibly expensive um, at the time that I was doing my research, tw 2011 to 2013, uh, you had to have the family pool assets in order to afford buying one home. So the assets tended to flow towards men in the family. So in addition to women kind of handing over their savings and not having their names on the deed, this wasn't because the women didn't want to own the property. It was because they were pressured in all these different ways. Um, one of the ways in which they were pressured was also from parents, the parents of the boyfriend they were marrying, their future mm -hmm. in-laws, who had spent their entire lives scraping and saving to buy a home for their son because of the very strong norm of male home ownership. 
Um, one of the myths that I basically debunked when I was writing this book, but everybody in China believed it. I mean, it was also peddled in the state media. Was that women uh, will not marry a man in China unless he already has a home, and this was supposedly showing you how greedy women were. Um, but I found no, that's not at all what's going on. That I, I, I basically thought that that was part of the propaganda campaign. So on the one hand, there, um, you know, the government wants to upgrade population quality. It wants, uh, you know, a politically stabilizing influence of pu putting more of these educated women into marriages, and, and that'll also address the sex ratio imbalance, mm -hmm. which is another really big yeah. population problem. Um, but there's also, because property is such an integral, really pillar of Chinese economic growth, this is where the vast majority of Chinese consumers have their wealth. It's all in a home. It's something that the government cannot allow to fail. So it's not really a free market. Um, but under these conditions where there are a lot of state regulations kind of the government keeps saying, oh, we're, we're determined, or at least several years ago when it was still a really hot real estate boom, we're determined to keep, prevent prices from overheating and getting too high. But I also believe, and um, this is something that I write about in the book, that they also didn't want prices to come down too much. And there are many ways in which, I, I mean, I don't know, this is an argument of mine, but in a way, because um, young Chinese people were apolitical for the most part for a very long time. They didn't want to get too involved in, you know, calling for the overthrow of the, the Communist Party. It was, it was a real struggle to, to save up money, to buy a home. Um, that combined with gender discrimination, you know, a, a, most of the parents that I um, heard about from both the women and the, the men that I interviewed, the parents tended not to help their daughters buy a home at all, but they would bend over backwards to help the son. Mm -hmm. and, and, and often, even when the parents only had one child, if the child was a daughter, even then I found a lot of cases where the, the parents would then say, well, you, my daughter, you don't need my help because you're a woman. I'm going to help my <laughs> nephew <laughs> instead. And these poor women would be there, well, uh, but I still really want to buy a home. So then they would, you know, try to save up all their money to buy a home. And, uh, it, it's very complicated and yeah. I get into it a lot. It's yeah. very nuanced and, um, but it's quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. All of the different ways in which, um, also state regulations, uh, preventing single people, uh, say in Shanghai, today even. Mm -hmm. If you're a single woman in Shanghai without a hukou, you cannot buy a home, no matter how much money you have. Well, I'm sure there are loopholes if you're loaded. <laughs> but if we're a normal woman living and working in Shanghai, if she doesn't have a hukou, she cannot buy a home there. So, of course, that's another way in which these women who are you know, quite educated, yeah. um, have a good job, that they're pushed into marriage. Um, so this is one area where, well, now the real estate boom is over. Um, so women completely missed out, or most women missed out on this vast accumulation of real estate wealth with the privatization of housing and, and all of these forms of gender discrimination that come into play. And now that there is a severe real estate turn, downturn, you actually see more single women being able to buy their own homes. But I don't think that that's necessarily something to just be celebrated because it's no longer a great investment. Yeah. Um, and the real estate developers themselves need to offload these properties. And so you actually see some developers targeting single women and saying, oh yeah, now this is perfect for a single woman. You can buy this apartment. So when I read um, reports about how single women are more empowered, which is very true in many ways, and just look at all the single women who are now buying homes of their own. Yes, those women wanted to buy yeah. when I was doing my interviews back in 2011, but they couldn't. Now they can, but lo and behold, there is a severe property downturn. Right, right. And so is the government going to really allow 
the real estate sector to totally collapse, mm -hmm. you know, I'm inclined to think no. Right. Um, and so in some ways, single women, you know, can be playing a small role in kind of bailing out these real estate developers. Uh, but I mean, this is not, this is very hypothetical. Sure, sure. But they've also lost out on that massive growth over the past decade yeah. in terms of wealth accumulation. Um, I think in, in, a, in an era of negative population growth, real estate issues in China and declining marriage rates, it's a really good time to read Leftover Women, um, latest book. And I recommend uh, to all of our audience to go out and buy it because there were some really jaw-dropping moments for me and it was very easy to read, although it was kind of a, sa a sad and scary message, but one that's really worth watching for those of us who are looking at issues of gender equality, equality but also um, the Chinese party state and its approach to governance. So I'd like to thank Leda for, for joining us this afternoon, Churan and Emily. Thank you so much and thank you audience for tuning in.